everyone. Welcome to Candidate Conversations. My name is Ellen Dennis, and I am the state government reporter at the Spokesman Review newspaper. We're here in Spokane, Washington today. I am joined by government editor Jonathan Brunt right next to me, and we're also joined today by Dave Upthegrove, a Democratic candidate for state commissioner of public lands. Dave, thanks so much for being here today. My pleasure. The State Commissioner of Public Land serves a four-year term and oversees Washington's massive Department of Natural Resources, an agency in charge of nearly six million acres of forests, beaches, and other public lands. To begin with today, how about you give us your pitch? Why are you running for this office and why should people vote for you? Well, thanks. First, it's a pleasure to be here. I think civic education is uh, critical for informing the public to make good decisions. Managing our public lands in the public interest for all the people of the state of Washington is what voters deserve in a state lands commissioner. The commissioner has big responsibilities to oversee aquatic lands, agriculture lands, timber lands, wildfire prevention and response, recreation. The commissioner also has opportunities to provide benefit to our rural economies and to our clean energy future. The people of the state of Washington have strong conservation values, and I will carry those values with me into this job as commissioner. Um, Voters deserve a commissioner who's balanced, who's independent-minded, who's inclusive, and I will be that leader. Our state lands don't belong to industry. They don't belong to big business. They belong to we the people. They're public lands. They're our lands. And I want to manage these lands for the benefit of all the people of the state of Washington. Do you believe that the state currently is um, allowing the proper amount of timber use on state lands? Yes. Uh, I think a strong, healthy forest practices industry is vital for our state. And I want to maintain our existing level of timber harvest. But we can do better. How? Um, First, by changing, making modest changes to where we harvest, by deferring the harvest of a small group of older forests that have a tremendous benefit to climate and biodiversity, and instead harvesting other parts of the forest in those same communities. We also can do better by acquiring in the long term replacement timber lands. Um, For example, many private timber companies will sometimes, uh, after they harvest, will sometimes sell off that property. And private timber lands account for 70% of our wood products industry. I'd like DNR to use existing revenue streams to buy those lands, replant them, and return them to forestry. And by doing that, we can sustain rural economies, we can maintain good paying jobs, and we can fully fund public services, including our schools. I think that's one way by making changes to where we harvest and by growing the trust that we can do things better for climate and for biodiversity. That is maintaining all those state lands and buying more? Or would you be selling some off? I would use existing revenue streams. um, For example, under the Climate Commitment Act, there's a new revenue stream um, called the Natural Climate Solutions Fund. We also, in some limited cases, could use the Trust Land Transfer Program um, or as a last resort, uh, just state bonds. And it would be growing the trust with new timber lands. And this would be in the long term. I'm talking about over, for example, the next 40 years. And I'm proposing that because if we're going to manage a small subset of older forests differently, you know, and let me be clear, we can still manage them for wildfire prevention. We can still manage them for forest health and other uses, recreation. um, That reduces the overall size of the trust holdings that we are harvesting. And so in order to maintain our sustainable harvest levels, I want to um, take advantage of those opportunities to prevent conversion of private forest lands to other uses like sprawl. You know, we've done this successfully before. Um, This was one of the tools that was used to help create the Mountains to Sound Greenway in the I-90 corridor, you know, uh, over the last few decades. Simpson Timber and others 
harvested and sold it off and DNR acquired those lands and put it back into active forestry. And I think that's a model um, that can be one of the tools to make sure we are meeting our commitments to rural communities when it comes to generating revenue for the trust beneficiaries. What would you say, though, to local governments who might be concerned about uh, more land being taken off the, the tax rolls? Um, I have a couple ideas. In the short term, um, uh, I would like they will receive payment in lieu of taxes, PILT, and I'm proposing that the legislature make some changes to how we reimburse counties when that happens. When counties do get a payment from um, other governments uh, when a land is put into conservation, but it's based on a conservation value, I'd like the legislature to change the law to account for those other values that forest has. If we're making a policy decision for all the people of the state of Washington to manage that forest for climate, habitat, recreation, uh, those, you know, wildfire prevention, flood protection, all these values that a healthy forest has, um, we should value those in our payment to those local governments. And it makes some democratic sense because those are broad public values the whole state benefits from. And that creates a little bit of a shift, a property tax shift. So those local counties would get a higher return, and that would be borne by shifting. I mean, you wouldn't notice it would be modest, but philosophically, at least, it's shifting onto all the voters of the state. So that's um, one way. Um, that how much land do you think, if you know, you could wave a magic wand, how much more land do you think should be part of the state, yep. under the state ownership as, and under the yep. Lands Commission? Yep. The... What I am recommending is that if we are going to defer the harvest of 3% of our state-owned forest lands, that over the next 40 years, we consider acquiring 3% more. And these would be lands that would otherwise go out of forestry. So it's a way to maintain active forestry on those parcels. Um, and it's unclear, you know, the when those will come available, where they will be, but we have seen over the years, like I said, this used successfully. There are times when the private timber companies sell off that land. We're seeing overall in the state, for the first time ever, less than 50% of the state is forested. We are seeing over time those pressures. And most of the forestry is on private timber land. That's an important point to make. The DNR manages 30% of our, our forests. And so strategies that help that other 70% <coughs> stay in active forestry under ownership, uh, in this case of the state, um, is a way to sort of offset the management of that 3%. And, um, and that number comes from our state's habitat conservation plan. We have, the state of Washington has an agreement with the federal government um, on how we're to manage habitat. And that habitat conservation plan has always had as a, one of its objectives the restoration of 5 to 10 percent of our lowland evergreen forests on the west side um, being restored to this old growth like condition. And so that's always been an objective. And um, some of these lands were even deferred under previous commissioners. Um, and so I'm just trying to bring innovative, creative ideas to the table on how do we meet those goals while still meeting our responsibilities to the trust beneficiaries. There's also broader conversations to be had about changes in the payment of lieu of taxes, how do we fund our schools? A lot of those are legislative decisions, but um, worth, worthy of exploring. Out here in Eastern Washington, it seems like every summer people are bracing themselves for smoke season and devastating wildfires. A little over a year ago last year, we saw the Gray and Oregon Road fires completely wipe and decimate a medical lake, and it was really tragic. Um, are fires like that, um, or I guess to rephrase, was the damage that happened from that fire preventable from a Department of Natural Resources standpoint? I don't know, but I do know we need to do everything in our power to prevent the risk of wildfire. <clears throat> you know, um, it's a matter of public safety. It's increasingly a matter of public health with the smoke. And this department, and under my leadership, will do everything we can to prevent 
wildfires. Um, for me, uh, a managed forest is a healthy forest. And I want to build upon the good work that Commissioner Franz has done and take every penny the legislature will give us and put it into forest health. And by forest health, I mean things that reduce the risk of wildfire while also helping those forest lands. Uh, controlled burns, non-commercial thinning, and commercial thinning. Um, we also need to not overlook routine things, um, maintenance of the lands, uh, invasive species removal. These kind of things are often overlooked but can also have an impact. And then we need to work collaboratively with our utilities and others who use the lands to make sure that the practices they're engaging in don't increase the risk of human causes. We need to communicate with the public uh, around wildfire safety uh, and risk. But we always have the risk of lightning strikes. There always is the risk of human error. Um, uh, but we need to do everything we can to increase our prevention efforts. And I'd like to see us move that west in mountains as well. As uh, Right now we're doing all that work just in eastern Washington. I also want to, I don't know what this looks like yet, but implement uh, performance monitoring to figure out which of these forest health treatments are really helping us with uh, reducing the wildfire risk themselves so that we're targeting those uh, dollars most effectively. Ponderosa pine forests look a lot different than the Doug fir forests that we see on the western side of the state. What are the biggest differences you've seen in fire prevention and suppression in those separate types of ecosystems? And um, what would you use the office to do to address the differences? You know, the lowland evergreen forests on the west side have some natural fire prevention characteristics that ponderosa don't, pine don't have. You, particularly in some of the naturally regenerated forests, you have a canopy structure that creates the shading that uh, traps the moisture and creates environments that are um, reduce the wildfire risk. With ponderosa pine, you don't see that. Um, I don't know that there are uh, when we at the thousand foot level, substantially different management tools, the uh, vegetation, the nature of the landscape, particularly because of the canopy cover is different. You see more of the grasslands incorporated versus the complex understory. Um, it gives you other management tools. You can some areas can integrate grazing as a, a management tool. Um, uh, sometimes the uh, the cattle can you know, keep that fuel level down, prevent overgrowth, can uh, deal with invasive weeds. So you have some opportunities for management that are, uh, I think, uh, that are different. But the fundamental premise is the same. That's recognizing that the money we invest in prevention is worth it. They teach you in local government, uh, you know, I'm the, currently the chair of the county council in, over in King County, and they teach us that emergency preparedness has four stages, emergency management prevention, preparation, response, and recovery. And it gets a lot more expensive to go down that line, not to mention the impact on the cost of life. So I will always believe that investing dollars in prevention of wildfires is, is worth it. And the, while the, forest, the exact forest health treatments might look different, the fundamental value, which is the importance of investing in that forest health work, is the same. The things that you want to do uh, to either deal with the impacts of climate change or to prevent further climate change? Hmm. Um, we have an opportunity and I think a responsibility to the next generation to do everything we can to mitigate the impacts of carbon emissions. And DNR has a huge role to play here. Number one, I think we can improve our forestry practices. That's why I'm interested in managing a small subset of forests differently uh, and keeping more forests in forestry. Um, these Pacific Northwest uh, evergreen forests are some of the biggest carbon sinks. And while I intend to manage them sustainably for wood products, I think we can do that better, as I said. And some of these older uh, mature forests not only provide uh, valuable habitat, but also are important carbon sinks. Um, the other area I'm excited to work on uh, is to help us meet our clean energy targets in this state. The legislature passed a law that said utilities have to provide all their energy from clean energy sources by 2045. And we can't say no to fossil fuels and not say yes to something else. So I want to work to ensure that 
we're using our state lands to help facilitate the deployment of clean energy generation and transmission to get it where it needs to go in the state. And it's challenging. Uh, there's a lot of conflict around that, but as solar, wind, and perhaps other emerging technologies uh, come online, um, and it's why I've proposed the creation of a new clean energy trust. And it starts with a process where we help identify suitable locations because there are conflicts. There's tribal treaty rights. Sometimes there's habitat issues. It cuts both ways for agricultural lands. This can be an economic benefit for some farmers. It, it can also be a risk to maintaining productive ag lands. So there's a lot of balancing interests, but we have to start with the fundamental position that we need to do this. We need to have the energy and we need to be able to get it where it needs to go in the state. And so I would like to identify those areas. And again, if there are lands for sale that are appropriate, have DNR pick up those lands, purchase them, lease it to the clean energy developers, wind and solar, put that money back into rural communities for economic development. And by doing that, we can help avoid some of those conflicts. We can help meet those clean energy goals and hopefully in the long run target those dollars back into rural economic development. Would you be going to the legislature for more money for some of these You would proposals? need, yeah, you'd absolutely need um, capital funding. And the, and the state does have, you know, usually every year, unless they can't get along that year, uh, there's usually capacity under the, the debt limit to issue bonds and the natural resource agencies always have wish lists and and I think um, given the public interest, and I don't mean it in terms of them being interested in it, but given the public value and the public necessity of being able to generate and transmit this energy, um, I think the legislature would be open to helping facilitate the steps necessary, particularly when we can avoid conflicts by doing it. So I'm, uh, it's gonna be hard work. I think um, one of the things that I think I bring to this job is a history of bringing together diverse parties to find common ground and a path forward. And I think some of those skills that I've demonstrated throughout my political career would be very valuable in a role like this. Um, because everyone's right. I mean, to some degree, it's not, it's not as, yes, we have to respect tribal treaty rights. Yes, we shouldn't destroy shrub step habitat. Yes, we should maintain agricultural or agricultural lands, and yes, we need clean energy. And so you have to approach this with um, a spirit of collaboration and upfront communication and a lot of hard work in finding those, those paths forward. And I think that's, um, with my time in the legislature and in local government, have demonstrated an ability to do that. And it excites me. To, um, you know, this is an important transition into clean fuels and that's going to make a difference for generations. And it's one of the things that's motivated me to run for this office. If you're elected, what is the first bill that you would back and push for um, in the legislature to be voted on? Ooh, the first bill. Uh, you know, this may sound like a cop-out, but uh, the first bill that I'm going to be working on is uh, the agency has to present a budget. <laughs> And uh, when I'm elected commissioner, I'm going to have about 60 days until, you know, where I, and I would get sworn in the first day of the legislative session. And so the budget bill is the first thing I would work on. Um, so much of the work needed to manage the agency depends, one, on the revenue we generate at the agency, but I think we can do a better job of managing the lands for everyone in the state if we could get some more support. For example, the forest health work I talked about, that takes money to be able to do those controlled burns, the, uh, that thinning. Um, I'm really interested in our aquatic lands and making sure we're not the generation that loses our iconic king salmon and the Puget Sound orca. And uh, I would like to see our aquatic land restoration teams get a little boost in the budget. Those are the folks who go around and get rid of the nasty creosote pilings and plant the eel grass. and get rid of the derelict fishing gear, doing it all in partnership with the community. And so there are some priorities at the agency uh, in that budget bill. I want to expand recreational opportunities, and that's also a budget item. Um, you know, I, uh, I, we often see recreational conflicts, ORV users maybe tearing up something they're not supposed to, or people target shooting where they shouldn't, 
And I think the way to avoid that is to, for DNR to invest in the development of appropriate places to do those things, to let's develop another ORV park. Let's have a shooting range that's in a safe managed location. Let's grow our horse trails. And those are all budget needs as well. And so there are a lot of, I think the budget is going to be the first piece of legislation that I'm, I'm working on. Okay. What would you say sets you apart from your opponent in this race? Sure. I have a lot of respect for my opponent. We uh, served together briefly in the legislature. Um, but there are differences between us and there are differences that matter. Um, my vision is to manage our public lands in the public interest for all the people of the state of Washington. My opponents has historically voted um, on behalf of the private financial interests that benefit from our financial, benefit financially from our public lands. Uh, voting, for example, to roll back clean water protections. Voting to blow a hole in our Endangered Species Act. Um, opposing the state's Climate Commitment Act and our, the, the Paris Climate Accords. Um, you know, I'm interested in uh, putting forward a vision that, you know, protects our clean water, doesn't roll it back, that improves habitat, that meets our climate future. Um, my opponent has a F rating from the League of Conservation Voters nationally. Uh, 14% voting record on, on the environment. Uh, I also think I represent a more independent-minded approach. Um, I've uh, been willing to say no to my friends. I've been willing to um, bring diverse parties together. Um, my opponent, on the other hand, there's a, a nonprofit group called, I think it's GovWatch or something like that, that tracks voting records of members of Congress, and they um, tracked my opponent. They put my opponent in the category of rank and file Republican, meaning someone who votes regularly with their party, noting she voted 91 times as a, with the Republican Congress, um, has been endorsed by the Tea Party. Um, and uh, I think I offer more of an independent point of view. Um, you given some examples of policies where you might differ from the traditional democratic base on environmental issues such as uh, from the Sierra Club or uh, League of Conservation Voters. What would sure. something they would say, oh, I disagree with you on? Um, I can give a history as well, but I think moving forward, you know, there's a lot of debate over um, this wildfire management. There is a, a, a significant body in the environmental community that takes sort of a let it burn approach that artificially suppressing wildfire is not good for habitat. And I have um, not equivocated or wavered one bit in my belief that we need to center public safety and invest in these thinning practices and controlled burns. Uh, I think that is, that is one. You know, my commitment to uh, maintain our sustainable harvest levels to meet the responsibilities to the trust is met with some skepticism from the environmental community over why am I setting that as a goal? But I think this job's about balance and I'm looking for new creative ways to do better for climate and biodiversity um, uh, while still meeting those responsibilities to our schools. And this is nothing new. I, um, I shared a story the other day with a group I was meeting with. Uh, when we created the Puget Sound Partnership, the state agency, the environmental community wanted that agency to have regulatory authority. And I didn't think it was right for a non-elected body to trump our shoreline laws. And I was the chair of the committee and I made that hard call and had lobbyists from these environmental groups crying tears in my office after I mean, they had a big PR campaign and political campaign against me. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I work part time as a basketball referee for youth high school and adult basketball leagues. And I uh, one of the things I've learned is there's a lot of similarities between the two jobs. In both cases, only you know in your heart if you're being fair and doing the best job you can. In both cases, there's people yelling at you while you're trying to do your job. And in both cases, when the game's over, you slink off the court, disappear, and everyone's mad at you. And this job requires someone who leans into those conservation values, who's going to center and uplift those conservation values of the state, but do it in a way that's collaborative, creative, and independent-minded, still meets our obligations to the trust. And that's um, what my history has been, fighting for the public interest. My opponent has tended to advocate for the 
um, private interest of those that make money off the lands. One more question for you. What is your favorite tree? Very important for voters to know. <laughs> Pressing. I'm going to have to go with western red cedar. Uh, growing up, I, uh, we had a big red cedar tree in our yard at home. A great, I mean, it's huge mm. now, and it has a great historic significance for the coastal tribes. It smells good. Uh, it's what I think of when I go out into a, a western Washington forest. Right. Yeah, those are gorgeous. We over here in eastern Washington are partial to the ponderosa pine, but we can agree to disagree on this one. <laughs> I probably should have been politic and given an eastern Washington. No, you're honest. That's good. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us, Dave. Um, the election will be November 5th, and ballots will be mailed out. Mid-October. Yes. Thank, thank you. you. Thank it you. It was fun.